Welcome to the exam review of the UK Actuarial Professions CT6 exam paper for April 2015. I'm John Lee, a tutor from ACTED, the actuarial education company, which provides tuition on behalf of the actuarial profession. On this video, we'll give a brief overview of each of the questions on this paper. For more detailed solutions, please refer to our asset, ACTED Solutions and Exam Technique, which will give both model and alternative solutions as well as a thorough explanation of all the steps. This will be available from our eStore in time for students' preparation for the September exam. The paper kicks off with a question on two-player zero-sum games. This makes it only the second time this area of decision theory has been tested. And in addition, we've got a little twist, because two of the values are unknown. And we need to determine what these need to be so that there are dominated strategies and a saddle point. However, because the question says determine, the examiners wanted students to explain their reasoning and not just state the answer. So if students simply said x should be less than 8, they would have received no marks. Despite this twist, it wasn't particularly demanding, just unusual. However, given that students usually bank on getting all the decision theory marks, and this was the first question, it might have thrown them off stride. Question 2 is on runoff triangles. And this time, it's the Bornhotter-Ferguson method. And even more fantastically, we only have to apply this for one accident year. This should have been absolutely no problem whatsoever for well-prepared students. However, don't get caught out by the tiny twist at the end, because we're asked to estimate the total claims and not the reserve. Question 3 tests reinsurance. And this is a gorgeous question. Part 1 is simple bookwork. And part two is the number crunching. This year it's on the Pareto distribution. We're asked to determine the lowest retention amount so that only 5% of claims involve the reinsurer. So we simply have to calculate the value of the retention M such that the probability is only 5%. This would have presented absolutely no problem whatsoever. Question four tests Monte Carlo simulation. For part one, we're given an exponential distribution and we're asked to construct an algorithm. Well, this will be a straightforward application of the inverse transform method. For part two, we have an unusual distribution, and we're asked to use the acceptance rejection method. However, it doesn't tell us the function to use. Hopefully you realize that since this was part two, we might be using the function from part one. However, some students didn't twig this and were left panicking. Worst comes to worst, at least write down the algorithm as that will gain you some marks. Frustratingly, the notation used in this question is the other way round to the notes. And part three asks us to calculate the expected number of pseudo-random numbers required. Remember that we accept one over C of the values generated. So on average, we will need to run the algorithm C times to generate an observation. But don't get caught out. This doesn't ask for the observation. It asks for the number of random numbers needed and each simulation requires two of them. Question 5 tests EBCT Model 2, which has only been asked once before since its return to the syllabus in 2010. Given that nearly all the formulae are in the tables, this should have presented no problem. However, unlike the previous question, which was just a copy of the core reading example, this requires a little bit more of an intuitive feel. Recall that the formula to calculate the credibility premium per policy for risk I is as follows. And in this question, we are told the expected claims for risk one. And so it may have been tempting to say that this is the credibility premium for risk one. However, this is the aggregate expected claims. And we're told that we have 30 policies. And so the credibility premium per policy for risk one will be this 25,200 divided by the 30 policies. For the rest of the formula, we'll need x bar 1, which is given in the table, and we'll also need x bar, which is not given. Now, this is model 2, so we can't simply do an average of the three x bar i's. We'll need the total claims for all of the risks, and then divide it by the total policies. But we're not given the total claims, we're only given the mean claim size per policy. So you'll need to take those means and multiply them by the number of policies to get the total claims, and then divide that by the number of policies. Once you've got that, you can get your Z1. Once you've got your Z1, 
you can get your E of S squared over variance of M, and then you can use that in your Z2 and Z3 and you're off. And this would have been no bother for students who have attended our tutorials or use the online classroom, as it's quite similar to one of the questions in the handouts. Question 6. Test generalised linear models. And it's in fact exactly the same as April 2012 question 7. So students who practised past papers would have found this easy. Those who hadn't would have been freaked out. I'm sure there's a moral here, but I can't quite put my finger on it. We're given a Poisson distribution, which has a different mean for each of the types of policies. And part one, we're asked to obtain the maximum likelihood estimates of these means. This would have been an easy five marks. But in part two, we're asked to test whether the means are equal using the scale deviance. This is the first hint that we're doing generalised linear models, but it's a little bit unstructured. Recall that the difference in the scale deviances between two models is approximately a chi-squared, with degrees of freedom equal to the difference in parameters. Well, our first model has three means, mu1, mu2 and mu3, and our second model is at the means of the same, i.e. we only have one mean, mu. So we're comparing a model with three parameters to a model with one parameter. Recall that the scale deviance is twice the log likelihood of the saturated model minus the log likelihood of the model that you're interested in. And so subtracting the scale deviances of two models, M1 and M2, will simply be twice the log likelihood of model 1 minus the log likelihood of model 2. The log likelihood of the first model with three means you would have calculated in part 1. The log likelihood of the second model with just one mean you'll have to calculate from scratch. Question 7 test time series, and judging by the number of emails I've received, was found to be one of the hardest questions by students. Part 3 requires us to calculate the autocorrelation function for a glorious 8 marks. Well, this would have been straightforward, which is every student's dream in the CT6 exam. However, we first have to perform two differencing transformations to get the time series that we'll actually calculate the ACF for. And that was the problem. Although this differencing idea is similar to September 2012 question 9, if students couldn't work this out, then they wouldn't have been able to access these wonderful 8 marks. Well, let's talk exam technique. Suppose you couldn't do part 1. How could you get further? Well, there's two approaches. The first to realise is that when you difference a time series, the white noise terms are unaffected. And so since we're told that the result is a moving average process, you could just use that. But suppose you didn't remember this, well your worst case scenario is to make up a time series, so you can at least get some marks. Obviously these would be reduced if your time series process was considered easier than the actual one, but something is better than nothing. Well how do we do this differencing? Well getting the autoregressive terms on one side of the equation, you'll notice that we've got a pair of values which are each one apart, and so we could apply a first order difference. Well, taking this out as a common factor, what do we do next? Well, the hint is given in part two. We're told that we're going to be applying seasonal differencing. And since we're given monthly data, you'll recall that means we'll take away the value 12 months ago. Well, that's what we've got here. And so we'll take a 12th order seasonal difference. Question eight is a beautiful question on the collective risk model and is extremely similar to September 2007 question 8. We're given a distribution for the number of claims and a Pareto distribution for the claim amount. And then we simply have to calculate the mean and variance of the aggregate claims. Well, this will just be using the formulae from the tables. However, the only problem is that we're not told explicitly what distribution N has. Well, obviously it's a discrete distribution, and any sensible student would have flipped through the tables and discovered that it was a type 2 negative binomial. And so they could simply look up the mean and variance. Those who didn't do this might have tried to calculate the mean and variance from scratch. This would have been very painful and would have probably have led them to give up. Again, exam technique. Supposing you hadn't realised this, it would have been better to just choose values for the mean and variance so you can at least get all the marks of the rest of the question. Once we've got this, we're simply going to calculate probabilities using a normal and log normal approximation. This is very standard stuff, however please remember to obtain the full marks 
you would be expected to use the normal tables with linear interpolation. And finally, part 3 asks which approximation is more reliable. Well, given that claims are positively skewed of long tails, I wonder which it could be out of the symmetrical normal distribution or the positively skewed log normal distribution. Question 9. Test Bayesian estimation. Part 1 requires us to prove that the Bayes estimate under all or nothing loss is the mode. This proof hasn't been asked since September 2006, question 5. And judging by the number of students that left it blank, it wasn't high on their list of things to remember. Part 2 asks us to derive the posterior distribution. And we're given a beta prior, and we're given some data. However, we're not told the distribution this data comes from. Well, students who've done many of these questions before would realise that nearly every time we're not given the distribution is because it's from a binomial. And students are supposed to recognise that. We're given two years' worth of data, 100 yachts are insured in year one, and 100 plus G yachts are insured in year two. And when there's a claim, we pay $1 million. And we're told in year one, that total claims are 13 million, i.e. there are 13 claims, and in year two, it's 20 million, i.e. 20 claims. You could either bundle these together and say there's 33 claims out of 200 plus G yachts or trials, or you could calculate these two probabilities separately, where P is the probability of a claim. So for example, for the 100 yachts, we have 13 claims, and so that must be 87 yachts with no claims. And here's all the different combinations. And you can do a similar thing for the second year. For part three, you're going to calculate the Bayesian estimate under quadratic loss, i.e. the mean, and all or nothing loss, i.e. the mode, and show that they can't be the same. This would have been fairly standard stuff. And the final question on the paper involves calculating the adjustment coefficient. However, this is for a case where we have excess of loss reinsurance. Well, claims occur as a Poisson distribution, and claim amounts have an exponential distribution, which is standard stuff, but will be a little bit messy on the algebra. However, unusually, this is the first time we've been asked to calculate the adjustment coefficient for the reinsurer. We'll recall that the formula is lambda plus CR, where C is your premium income, is equal to lambda times the MGF, with R instead of T. But we're doing this for the reinsurer, and so we'll need the premium for the reinsurer and the MGF for the reinsurer. To calculate the premium for the reinsurer, we'll use the standard formula of 1 plus your premium loading factor times lambda times the mean claims the reinsurer receives. However, in this question, the premium loading factor for the reinsurer is theta. And frustratingly, the examiners have chose to use x for the reinsurer's claims rather than z. I'm sure most of us can cope with the letter change. And so unsurprisingly, we're asked to calculate the components of this formula, i.e. the mean and the MGF, in the previous parts of the question. And once you've obtained the adjustment coefficient, you're asked to comment on it in part four. Well, given that we're doing excess of loss reinsurance with retention M, you'll discover that your adjustment coefficient doesn't actually contain M, which is worth mentioning. And so that just leaves part one of the question, where you have to explain why the claim's arrival for the reinsurer is also a Poisson. Well, the explaining might have caused a bit of confusion, but it shouldn't be too much bother to at least state that the rate will be the original Poisson parameter lambda, times by the probability that claims get referred to the reinsurer. If you wish to chat with your fellow students about this paper, then feel free to contribute to the post on our forums at www dot forward slash forums. Thanks for watching.